you're going to have a bath and you're going to cut your hair down and make yourself look a bit respectable and maybe, just maybe, I'll invite you up to my house. By this time, I'm talking to her, wow, she's really got spirit, this girl. And he's really liking her and he decides he's going to do it. So he straightened himself up a little bit and uh, he is invited to the house and meets dad and mom and they have a talk together and say, now look, I hear your conversation, it's really filthy. I can't stand it, I'm a church girl. If you think that you're going to even associate with me, you're going to clean up your language, your smell of tobacco. I think you've been drinking too. Now I don't approve of those things. This is not my style, this is not my lifestyle. We're not compatible. Now this time she's really landed on the line there and he's really going for it. So he cuts all these things out and He's starting to really look sharp. And after maybe six months or so of keeping company, she's got him to go to church. And he's gone to church with her. He still never made a decision for Jesus. And you see them coming out of church like this, dressed nicely in a suit, his hair back nicely. And they're walking down the street, you might say, my, what a fine young Christian couple. But I want to tell you something. That man's heart is desperately wicked and deceitful above all things. He might look all right on the outside. Man looks on the outward appearance. God is looking in the heart. That man is reformed, but he's not regenerated. He's doing it for Mary. Not for God. He's doing it for Mary. And there are millions of people today are doing things for Mary instead of doing it for Jesus. Reformed, but not regenerated. That is the problem. So, beloved, we have to understand, reformed, but not regenerated. We have to change our heart. We have to be born again. You can work at them. Wives, you can work at them and work at them and work at them. But the heart, the spirit, has to be changed. And then, the engapi love, the true love of God, comes inside and begins to flow out and bubble out and flow out like a river. Praise be to God. Can you understand that? Reformed is not regeneration. Regeneration is when the heart is made new. Passed from death unto life. You who were dead in trespass and sin, have he quickened in the newness life. It's an act of God. And if we've got that act of God in our heart, keep that act of God in our heart and keep it functioning in our heart. Submit to the word of God and submit yourselves one to another. Husbands and wives. We have that scripture that says, wives, submit yourselves unto your husband. But if you look just above that in Ephesians, it says, submit yourselves one to another. Submit yourselves one to another. Show you benevolence one to another. You look at it. Benevolence. Love, kindness, one to another, submission. Some people look down on the woman. We have this problem in Mexico. The woman is just like a chattel. The popular concept of a woman is that the man is sitting on his little burro with a wine bottle of wine in his saddle and he's playing his guitar and singing his beautiful songs and his little wife is walking along behind him barefoot with a bundle of sticks on her head and a two or three little children following. She's just a chattel. And they, the macho of the man keeps that woman down. But this is not what God intends. There is an equality. And in God's sight, there's neither male nor female. There's neither male nor female in God's heaven. And we have to realize that even though what he says, there is the head of the house and there has to be so and the woman expects that as the head of the house she respects him and if she has to function as the head of the house instead of him because he refuses to take that position she all the time in her heart there will be some sort of uh, feeling of resentment or even despising him because he does not assert his role as the man of the house and that thing can be destructive in a marriage a man must assert his position and live in his position but don't go beyond it. Not arbitrary, not dictatorial. In love. In love. You'll notice Jesus, he does not push himself on you. 
He does not force you to love Him. It is a choice. We become peculiar treasures to God because we choose to come to Him. We choose to love Him. We are creatures of choice. And a man cannot dominate the will of his wife. He must allow her will to function. And if he treats her right, she will love him and respond to him like God intended. He built into the woman that capability. And he built into us as human beings the capability of loving Jesus and loving God. So that we have a bond of love in the church towards Jesus Christ. And the closer we come in our life and walk with Jesus, the greater that bond of love. The head of the fruit cluster, the nine fruit listed in Galatians, is love. And we have a beautiful illustration of it in the first of Corinthians 13. Even though we have gifts of the Holy Spirit and all those things, if we have not love, we remain just one big zero in God's sight. Nothing. Sometimes we try to evaluate ourselves by our gifts or our God-given abilities, but they are given by God. It is the love, the thing that we grow, our character. It takes years to grow character. It takes years to grow fruit. You might have a fruit tree, but you're not going to pick fruit over the day you plant the seed. It's going to take you years for the tree to produce fruit, but it is perfect in all of its stages while it's growing. If it stops growing, that's where we have the problem. And a Christian, when they stop growing and stop growing in Christ, we have the problem. It becomes imperfect. The Bible says, let us go on unto perfection. And in the husband and wife relationship, we go on and on, and the love grows. And like your pastor said, when they're old, there's nothing more beautiful to see an old couple, gray-haired, holding hands. Sometimes it brings tears to my eyes. I see them sitting on a seat somewhere, holding hands. Through the years, they've gone, raised a family, their granddaddy and grandmama. They're in the sunset of life's journey, and they're holding hands. Hands that have worked, that are gnarled and cracked, and twisted with age and hard work. But they hold hands, just like they did on the day that they were courting. There's something very beautiful about that. Can you say amen? Very, very beautiful. And so, in our conduct and our walk, we make our marriage successful, or we can trample over it like we trample over flowers and bruise the petals of the flowers. I believe that we have to work at our marriage continually. Work at it, cultivate it. You can cultivate love. It is in the power of the will. Love is in the power of the will. What is that scripture? I don't know that I can find it for you. It's in Peter where it says that our soul is purified. Is it Peter 1 and verse 22? Chapter 1 of Peter 1 and 22, it says, The soul is purified unto an unpretended love. If I can find it for you, it's so beautiful. It means that the mind also. Let me see what I can find a bit quickly. Someone might find it. If you find it, call it out. Have you got it? Yes, what you said. 1 and 22. It's beautiful. You look at it, what it says. Seeing ye have purified your souls in obeying the truth. How do you purify your souls? Now remember, this is not your spirit. God has purified your spirit, your soul, your mind, your memory, your logic, your intelligence, your reason, your judgment, your will. That's your soul. The expression of your emotions is in your soul. It must be. Look at it. Born again, not of corruptible seed, but of the incorruptible seed of the word of God. But it says here, obeying the truth of this word of God through the Spirit unto an unpretended love of the brethren. See that you love one another with a pure heart fervently. A fervent love. Love one another with a fervent love. The Bible speaks of a fervent heat and a fervent love. When I was a little boy down here in Gippsland, my daddy had a blacksmith shop on the farm that we had, 
and he taught me to weld steel on the anvil in the forge. It's uh, almost a lost art today, you don't see it too much. But as a boy, I used to strike on the anvil and he would hold the two pieces of steel, we'd blow on the forge until it was a fervent heat. And you'd pull it out, it was beautiful, sparkling sparks, beautiful sparks, and you stick it together. And the moment they touched, it was welded together and fused together because of the fervent heat. And we beat the thing together and compacted it and the two become one. I've never forgotten that. A fervent heat. And he speaks of a fervent love. That's a fiery hot love that in it's inevitable when there's a contact, there's a bond that cannot be broken. And I would weld the ends of picks that would go into gravel and abrasive materials. And we'd put a hard piece of metal right on the tip of the pick. And once it got on there, no matter how many times you struck with that pick in rocks and gravel, a thousand times, you'd never break it off because it was welded with a fervent heat. Hallelujah. And that's what he's talking about here. And you'll notice that the love is expressed from the soul. So what we do with our soul, our soul has to be in harmony with our recreated spirit. Can you say amen? It has to be in harmony. Praise be to God. All right, I think we will leave it at that, and we'll answer a few questions, if we can, if we may. If you've got a question you'd like to ask, either easy, I'll give you an answer, and if they're hard, I'll let Ivan handle it. Yeah, um, sorry, earlier you spoke about, um, I mean, Adam, Verse uh, yeah. And you spoke about how he said, was, he said that Adam spoke that spoke about that he will. At the end of Genesis chapter two, yeah. Yes, he will. He will um, Thus shall a man. The reason a man will leave his father and yep. mother. Was it was it Adam speaking there? Was it? Was he still following on from saying, "This is now my bone, my bone, my flesh"? Well. There is conjecture, obviously, because people would say, well, it's unlikely that it was him because it doesn't make any sense, right? Yeah. And now we're talking about Genesis chapter 2, yeah. verses 23, 24, and 25, okay? Or verse 22. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from man made he a woman and brought her unto the man. And Adam said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Then we have this verse. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife and they shall be one flesh. Now, some people say that was an editorial comment made by Moses. Uh, the obvious sense is that it's a continuation of Adam's speech, but we would say, well, how would Adam have said that? It would have to have been a prophetic statement, as I was suggesting, for Adam to have said that. My, my personal opinion is that in fact it was Adam speaking prophetically that he, he had seen the revelation and purpose of God in Eve being presented to him, and he made this declaration that uh, was a descriptor of how marriage was going to function. In one sense, it doesn't really matter, though. No, you know, no, your faith isn't going to hang on that. When you mention it, I, just, I was just yeah. uh, Otherwise, it really has to end up being a, an editorial comment made by Moses when he was writing the, the historic summary. All of the books of Genesis, the Genesis, Exodus, 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 Deuteronomy, are called the books of Moses anyway. Jesus said so, you know, as Moses said. And uh, so uh, we can't even confirm it necessarily from, um, from uh, interpreting scripture. But uh, I think that it's sufficient to, to accept that um, there was a sense in which God's eternal plan was being revealed there. Not an afterthought, but in fact a revelation. Because this is the book of beginnings, not the book of afterthoughts. And uh, I really think that it's given here as a... A genesis. As a gen it's, a, it's a genesis. Yeah. I would like also to comment on what your pastor said about a woman being the helpmeet. Now remember, I said that we are the second Eve, or they are the Eve of the second Adam. The function, what would be the function? To be a helpmeet. Are we a help to Jesus? Are we his companion? He sent a companion, the Holy Spirit, the comforter, the companion, the communion of the Holy Spirit. But are we helping? Are we a help? Are we an asset in the function of Jesus in this world today? We have to look at that. Mm. 
we have to look at that. It's a tremendous point when you start to think about it, because we obviously are of the bride of the second Adam. The Bible states it not once, but many times. And the Bible says, his wife had made herself ready in the book of Revelation 19. So obviously there is going to be a union and there is preparation for the union now. But in this preparation, we should be a help and an asset to God. Well, why did he fill us with the Holy Spirit? Did he not say, the works that I do, ye shall do? And did he not say seven times in each address to all of the churches, each church, he said, the first thing he said, I know your work. As a helpmate? Can it be? I want you to think about that. Mm. Yeah, thanks, sir. And every man's work shall be tried as to what sort it is. I think we have a greater responsibility in the church and as the body of Christ than we even can imagine at this time. Jesus said you must be born again. Every Christian has two birthdays. Once of their mother, flesh and blood. That's a physical experience and a physical birth. We may not remember anything about it. But Jesus said, except you be born again, you cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. He was telling this to a grown man, Nicodemus, and Nicodemus didn't understand it. And he was an intelligent man. He, sw he said, what? Can we enter our mother's womb again and be born? And Jesus said, you don't understand what I'm saying. I'm talking of a spiritual thing. Correct? He said, the wind blows where it listens, and so is the things of the Spirit. And then over in uh, the uh, second of Corinthians 5 and 17, it says that we have been made new creations. We have been created again. We are a new species of human being. There is the covenant people, the Jews. There are the Gentiles, the no people in God's sight. And there are the Christians or those that are born again are the new species of human being. The spirit that is dead has come alive and we've been quickened in our spirit. So when God said to Adam, the day that you eat of that fruit, ye shall surely die, he didn't mean the physical body because we're here, but the spirit of man was cut off from God because of sin and become dead to God or separated from God. And uh, a person, even though they are very much alive, they can be vivacious, they can be, uh, even have a charisma of this life, vivacious and full of life, but they're still dead to God until that spirit has come alive. And the, that is the meaning of it. We pass from death unto life. What is it, uh, John 4, 5, 4, and verse 23 or 24 says we're passed from death unto life in Christ Jesus. So there's a distinction, a distinct statement about being born again. He that hath the Son hath life. He that hath not the Son of God hath not life. These things have I written unto you that you might know that you have life, and this life is in the Son. I am quoting the first of John 5, verse 11, 12, and 13. Three verses, and they all state the same thing that the life is in Christ Jesus. God's gift to the sinner and the world is life in Jesus Christ. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that if the world would believe on his son, the world would not perish, but the world would have everlasting life. The condition believing and accepting and following what God has provided for us. So that is the work of the cross. Uh, there's an interesting scripture referring to works. I believe you'll find it in the Ephesians 2 and verse 10. <coughs> it says, we have been created unto good works. We have been created for that specific purpose. Now that also supports what we said about being the helpmate of Jesus Christ, a companion and a helper and a supporter of Jesus Christ. Amen. Just to amplify what uh, was being said earlier, there was a case in point only recently where a particular person came to make a confession of faith because their wife had basically told them that they had to. 
And it was an interesting, interesting situation because the person in coming to be saved was trying to be sincere. They really felt, well, I guess I've really got to become a Christian. I've been sort of hit over the head by my wife enough times and I'd better come and get myself saved. And uh, they went through all the motions, prayed the right prayer and did all the right things. But the spark plug never fired on the inside. You know, if I, you know what I mean when I say that? Uh, th th just nothing happened. And then they tried to learn how to look like a Christian, That's how to problem. act like a Christian. They were reforming themselves because they said, well, I've done the right thing. I, I, I must be born again because I've gone through the motions. And, and, and they tried to play Christian They'll and, do good works. and felt that their Christianity, that, that they'd been cheated somehow. And when we got to thinking and praying about it the, in this particular case, I began to realize that the person wasn't saved because the Holy Spirit drew them. They weren't born of the Spirit. And then I, I, I found that what um, Ivan was saying earlier in Romans 10 uh, and verses 9 and 10 is really where the key is, you see. For if you shall confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and shall believe in your Spirit. heart that God has raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. For with the heart man believes unto righteousness exactly. and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Now a person comes along <coughs> and says, I'm ready to confess Jesus Christ as my Saviour. You say, why? Well, I've thought it through. <laughs> right? I've thought it through. I've analysed it. I've looked at all the alternatives and, and I guess there's no better. It makes good sense to me that it's about time I became a Christian. Now that's, that's not a Christian. A Christian has to believe in their heart and confess with their mouth. It's a not analyse with their head and then confess with their mouth. And then we have to be sensitive in spirit to look for the fruit of that. By their fruit you'll know that. You'll know them and looking for that life that should be there. And if we, if we find that once they've gone through the motions, there's just no spark in their spark plug, there's no life in their spirit, then we have to realise that, uh, that, they may, that they may sincerely believe that they're a Christian in that they've gone through all the motions, but they've been cheated because somebody gave them a head knowledge or beat, beat them over the head until they did something, but their own spirit didn't respond. Nothing came out of their own heart. And that's a deep area, important area. The particular case in, in point is... is, is, is distance from here in a separate situation and, and uh, uh, what, what has delighted me in that particular case is that I found, uh, heard word that the, the, that the husband is actually getting hungry Hallelujah. to really know God. Amen. But that was really a response to people's prayer. He's, not, he's now going to come on in the kingdom not because he was berated to become a Christian but because people prayed and the Spirit of God's moved on him and now he, he's, he's hungry to say, well, I've really got to get to the bottom of this. I really want to know God. And so that hunger's coming there. I believe preachers in the past have been unfair, where they've berated people to come down the front, and yeah. people have said, well, I suppose I better, I think I understand it. And the Spirit of God wasn't calling them. And we're far better off praying for those people, and letting the Spirit of God move them. Uh, I would like to add something to that, because it seems like it is something you're seeking a truth here. There's a soulish faith. There's a sensual faith, a Thomas kind of faith. When I see it, I'll believe it. But there is a believing to see. Like David said, I believe to see the goodness of God. So a spiritual faith is totally separate from human faith. But sometimes these people that are not born again, they're operating with a soulish faith, an intellectual faith. It's got to be true because it's the word of God. This is their rationale. But it's up here. It's in their head. It's a soulish thing and not a spiritual thing. Spiritual faith, divine faith is resident in your spirit as Romans 10 indicates, that we've, we've uh, indicated the word is neither in the mouth and in thy heart, not in your intellect. And Jesus said, you'll recall, let these words sink down in your ears. Now, <laughs> sometimes the word passes through and sometimes it doesn't sink down, it goes up. Unless they were standing on their head, uh, he wanted to get away from the intellect and intelligence. He wanted to get a word living in the spirit. So there's wisdom in these things when you think about it. And something I was going to say, sister, the Bible says in Psalms, whosoever goeth forth weeping, bearing precious seed, the word, shall doubtless come again rejoicing, bringing in the sheaves. Now, in a case like that, Paul said, I travail again until Christ be formed in you afresh. I travail again. That word travail. Uh, a mother goes into travail or labor to bring forth 
bring to birth her child. And when that labor starts, she'll bring to birth, or she'll die in the tent, but she'll bring to birth. Now, there's something very interesting about that when you consider it, and God has likened the spiritual birth to a human birth, a physical birth. At that time, the will, we have to think about that will. It's a very important thing. The will is the executive of our soul. Unless we have a will, an agreement of the will to surrender to Christ, we will never surrender to Christ. Jesus said, you will not come to me until you have, uh, that you might have life. The human will. The prodigal son was in the pig trough. But until he agreed and said, I will arise, until he agreed in his will to go back to the father, he would stay with the pigs. Even though the fatted calf and the robe and the ring and the love of the father, everything was there waiting. The father, in fact, ran. But the human will was keeping him from that uh, life that was offered by the father. Now, coming back to the will, when a birth is taking place, the baby's will is superimposed upon, no matter whether it kicks, it cries, it scratches or protests, and it usually does when it comes to birth, but it has no say. The mother is going to bring to birth regardless of the will of the child. Now, God created us with a free will, and God can't violate that. I don't believe the devil can either without our agreement. We have to agree to submit our will. And so, the only time that I believe that we can impose our will over another person as a human being is when we go into intercession. Intercession, a travail, a labor, which is almost unto death, an agony, a cry, an acceptance of the load that that person has, taken upon ourselves, almost you can say, taking their load of sin or sickness upon yourself, and you cry unto God, the Holy, you become an intercessor by the fact of the Holy Spirit that is dwelling inside you who is an intercessor, and you cry to God. We could quote Romans 8, verse 26 and 27. It's a lost art almost today. The art of intercession and travail. To close the subject, there's an interesting scripture in Isaiah 66, isn't it 66, that says, and God speaking of this same subject, speaking about the, what's going to happen to Israel. Let me read it to you if I can. And it is pertinent to the question you're asking. Verse 7. Before she travailed, speaking of Israel, she brought forth. Before her pain came, she was delivered a man-child, Jesus Christ. Now, who had heard of such a thing? Who had seen such things? Shall the earth be made to bring forth in one day? Or shall a nation be born at once? For as soon as Zion travailed, she brought forth her children. I believe this is a future prophecy of what's going to happen to Israel during the tribulation period when that great statue is erected in the middle of the tribulation and the Jews that have made a covenant with the Antichrist will realize that they've been fooled again and they cry mightily unto God. But look what it says, verse 9. Shall I bring to birth and not cause to bring forth, saith the Lord? Shall I cause to bring forth and shut the womb, saith thy God. In other words, when we plant the incorruptible seed and we're in an agony of intercession and we're soaking the word that we plant with our own tears, God said, shall there be a conception and not a birth? It's a tremendous thing for our churches to get an increase in our churches, to win souls to Christ Jesus. If we understand what God is saying, if we are in the right attitude when we plant the seed of the word, the incorruptible seed, there will be a fertilization of that word and there will be not only a conception, but there will be a birth. Amen. It's intercession. It's something I learned a long, long time ago and it stayed with me over the years and I've be, remained a successful soul winner and a church builder because of the practice of that truth. In other words, there is physical labor to bring us into the world. And there is also a spiritual labor to bring a child to spiritual birth. Both cases requires labor. Someone travailed, someone prayed, someone cried.